Good morning. Welcome to Mercy Village Church. We are thankful that you are here with us today. It's starting to get hot outside. It's almost summertime. Uh, we will continue to meet. We got our air conditioning fixed on the other side of the building. Nice and cool. Remember this time last summer, we were meeting outdoors once a month, which was fun, but it was also blazing hot. There was one day we met in that parking lot instead of at the amphitheater, amphitheater, and it was just blazing sun. There was no shade, no nothing. A giant sweat spots all over me. That was great. But that was part of our story. Deeply thankful that, that God has given us this place to meet as, as well, though nice and cool in here, and we're thankful that you're gathering with us. Uh, we have three core values that, right, any organization is going to have a mission statement, a vision statement, maybe some core values that really, and I'm quite honestly, they're designed to trump people's personal preferences so that even the leaders are held accountable to something. Uh, and that's the mission and the vision and the, and the core values. Our second core value sa- is stated this way. We are invited by Jesus. He does extend to us an invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So he invites us, and we will abide with him communally. So that's one thing that God's done, or Jesus has done, invite us. And that's something that we do in response. We abide with him together in community. And so we have community groups that meet house to house throughout the week. They're actually getting ready to to have a little bit of a less formal scheduling throughout the summer. We do that intentionally because everyone's so busy during the summer. Uh, when it's not summer, they meet week to week, house to house. That's a way that we live that out communally. We'll do stuff together. You'll see in our announcements here in just a second over the summer to make sure that we are together in community, not just on Sunday mornings, but as the people of God uh, outside of this place as well. Uh, to that end, if you're uh, a new visitor with us. We have cups. Here they are. These good looking things this is our gift to you today. So come find me. You're not a new visitor. You have the same last name as me. How could you possibly be a new, a new visitor? We, uh, but this is your gift and inside are just some different, uh, info about Mercy Village Church. We'd love to give these to you this week on Thursday evening at five thirty. We're going to do our Truth on Fire book study. There was a hiatus that we had, and a lot of that had to do with my inconsistency, but Jeremiah has taken over our scheduling, which has been a tremendous help. And so we're, we're going to hit chapters one through four this Sunday or this Thursday evening. So if you're a part of that book study, uh, come out. It'll be right here at 530 on Thursday evening. We'd love to have you here for that. And then this summer in June and July, right now, this is all the info, just save the second Wednesday of June and the second Wednesday of July. We're going to have church-wide uh, get-togethers at the park. I was just scheming with, well, Jeremy was scheming, not me, but uh, I was uh, welcome to scheme along with him. We're going to try to do some burgers and dogs one week, maybe a pig roast in July. Uh, so that could be, that'll be exciting. And these will be events you can invite friends and family to as well. Things that people maybe that you've wanted to invite to church, but maybe they're not going to show up on a Sunday morning, but they might show up for a pig roast or for a gathering at the park. Those will be, so save those dates now. We'll have more details as to the start time, but it'll be in the evenings. We'll pass out sheets, uh, pass around a sheet of uh, being able to volunteer for sides and stuff like that as we get closer to it. But right now, in your calendar, save the second Wednesday of June and the second Wednesday of July. And then uh, this Saturday, Barbersville, we got a lot going on. Barbersville Community Outreach. Uh, we will be, do we have a slide for that? I think it's three, two to three. We will um, uh, prep the meal. And then uh, from three to 4.30, we will serve the meal. Um, and so that'll be this uh, this Saturday. And so that is at the Senior Center. I'm trying to remember all the details. Senior Center, Jeremiah's heading that up. Three, 2 p.m. if you want to help prep. Uh, he's shaking his head back there. 3 p.m. if you want to help serve the meal to the folks who will, will come. So uh, that's this Saturday. 
And then lastly, we have a new sermon series starting in June. So first Sunday of June, uh, it's called Peculiar People. Maybe you don't want to go by that title, but the, the Bible's clear that there are things about us that are being transformed as the people of God that make us unique uh, and make us different from the world around us. We're going to look at eight different things through the summer that we hold to uh, tightly as Mercy Village Church. Uh, just distinct strategies that we have in ministry, and we'll, we're going to preach through them over eight weeks. Uh, so that'll start in June. So I think that is that is all. We're going to pray. The hope of this moment is that you can release the distractions, the worries, the anxieties, the um, burdens that you maybe are carrying with you and prepare to receive what it is that God has for us in this this hour or so together as the people of God. So, Father, today I'm symbolically breathing out, just releasing to you, and I pray that in the audience here we would do the same thing, that we would release to you our distractions, our burdens, our fears, and when you would prepare our hearts to breathe in, to, to receive what it is you have for us today from your word, uh, through music, uh, through communion. Uh, you know better than we even know what it is we need today. And so be to us exactly what you've promised to be in the unique situations that we find ourselves in. For your glory, for our joy. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We welcome you today. We are broken, welcoming the broken. We are weary, welcoming the weary. We are burdened, welcoming the burdened. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Will you stand with us? We're going to begin our gathering today looking to Jesus, who is the finisher of our faith. He came and took our place, lived and died the perfect death. We needed a substitute. We couldn't come to the Father of our own works. But Jesus, God in his wisdom made a way, sent his son Jesus for us, who lived the perfect life and died on a cross and raised from the dead on the third day. And that is our hope today. Jesus is alive. And so we can face death. We can face every uh, trial, every victory, knowing that Jesus is enough. And so we're going to begin our gathering singing this song together. Come on, church, let's lift our voices together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy and holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me sing worthy Worthy of every song we could ever sing 
Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you And Jesus, the name above every other name And Jesus, the only one who could ever say And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you, oh, we live for you And holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Come on, church. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will trust in you alone. And I will. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your and lead me in your love to those around me and holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. sing that bridge again as a prayer I will build my life upon your love and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken, and I will build my life upon your It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Amen.
is truly worthy of our praise. Sing this song together. Think about these words as we sing. Robed in everlasting light, your glory floods the earth and fills the sky. Almighty God, there's no one like you. A mountain tremble when you speak. I'm listening. You whisper changes everything. Almighty God, there's no one like you. Almighty God, there's no one like you. You are the Lord. Forever lifted high, you are the Lord. Passionate and kind, you are the Lord. And holy, holy, holy is your name. Sing holy. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Slow, slow to anger, rich in love. Your patience. Always chasing after us. This is your heart. There's no one like you. How great you are. There's no one like you. You are the Lord. Forever lifted high. You are the Lord. Compassionate and kind, you are the Lord. And holy, holy, holy is your name. You are, you are the Lord. Let the nation sing, you are the Lord. And Jesus, King of kings, you are the Lord. And holy, holy, holy is your name. Yes, holy, holy, holy is your name. And you broke off my heavy chains. Let them in the empty grave. And there is freedom. In your name, there's no one like you, God. There's none like you. Sing it again. And you broke off my heavy chain and left them in the empty grave. And there is freedom in your name. There's no one like you, God. There's none like you. There's no one like you, God. There's none like you. You are the Lord. Forever lifted high, you are the Lord. Compassionate and kind, you are the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is your name. You are the Lord. So let the nation sing, you are the Lord. And Jesus, King of kings, you are the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Sing holy. Holy, holy, holy is your name. You are the Lord. Amen. 
Hebrews 4 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. It's Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Our Father's love. This next song talks about how deep the Father's love is for us, that He sent His Son for us to die for us, to take our place. And now, as this verse says, He sits at the right hand of God and He is praying for us. He is interceding for us on our behalf. He doesn't leave us in the place that He saves us, but He is with us today in this very room. And so we can sing this song with hope, with joy today. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That He would give His only Son. To make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross my guilt upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished Yes, it is finished Oh, it is finished Oh, I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection And why should I gain from His reward I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain? Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Yes, this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Heavenly Father, thank you today for Jesus, for your Son. Thank you that we can gather today and you promise where two or more gathered, you are with us. You're in our midst today. God, draw us close to you as your word is preached today that we would learn more of you and who you are and what you have done for us. God, we want more of you today and less of us. We love you today. Amen.
Thank you. Be seated. seated and kids are dismissed. From our passage for today, a section of it, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand firm. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Introduce our speaker for today. I want to do two things. I want to tell you why we invite people to speak here at Mercy Village Church. We deeply value intentional multiplication. This will be one of the things we'll talk about in the sermon series uh, over the summer. It's one of our distinctives, eight distinctives. We desire to, this is directly from our perspectives, we desire to multiply servants, leaders, and churches. To that end, we will value sacrifice over influence, development over excellence, and sending over growing. Practically speaking, this means that our volunteers will be mobilized to equip volunteers that serve beside them. Our best, and that's in quotation marks intentionally, the people that we've grown to think are the best because they're the ones who normally are the ones leading. Our best leaders will frequently sit by cheering while up-and-coming leaders uh, take the stage. That's in quotation marks too because this isn't a stage. We're proclaiming the word of God. We're serving together as the church. And our church will embrace with joy wide swaths of people being called out to plant churches near and far. That's something we cling to as a church, that we would never become so comfortable with the way things are normally that we uh, can no longer intentionally multiply and grow as a church. So that's one of the reasons we have people come and fill the pulpit. Remember Logan Planting in Summersville, one of the things we said was we can't give you a whole bunch of money to plant a church in Summersville. We're a church plant ourselves. But we can give you cuts in our pulpit. You know how you learn to preach? You preach. Same way you learn to do anything else, you do it. And so we would let Logan fill our pulpit, and we watched him grow as a preacher, didn't we? And that was a blessing from God. It's exciting to be a part of a church plant in Summersville in that very practical way. Uh, northwest of Raleigh, North Carolina, there's going to be a church plant soon or later. Who knows? Who knows the timeline? They're still figuring it out. Planted out of Imago Day Church in Raleigh. Uh, we have dear friends there. And uh, Jay and Kim, our dear friends, decided what's better to do. You're both in your 60s. Is that true? <laughs> what's better to do in your 60s than plant a church, right? Because that's pretty easy. So they're uh, exploring with a core group of people what it will look like to plant in Youngsville, North Carolina, just northwest of of Raleigh. And so uh, we're going to have Jay preach for us today. This is my dear friend. We met Kim first in Guatemala. We were there with 127 Worldwide, and all she did was talk about Jay, and it was hilarious. And I'm like, I'm going to love this guy. I already knew it. Second time we met them, they invited us to just stay in their house. On my key ring, I don't know why this makes me emotional, but it does. They might not even remember, but this is a key to their house. They gave it to me. That's love, that's friendship, that's unity. And they have been those type of people to us over the years since we first met. I deeply am thankful for Jay. 
a brother to me. I don't know if you've heard of the app Marco Polo, but in some of the lowest and highest times of my life, he was always a Marco Polo conversation away, and he's encouraged my heart through that. These are people who know deeply what it is to love Jesus and love like Jesus, and we are excited for what God's going to do whenever he does it in Youngsville, North Carolina. And uh, Jay is not, has not been a prolific preacher. It's not something he does all the time. But when you plant a church and you got gray hair, they're going to ask you to preach every now and then, right? Because you got a little wisdom there. So he's trying to get back in the, get back in the preaching game. Not only that, and this is the last thing I'll say, Jay, and I'm going to pray over you. On his right calf, is it on your right calf? He's got a tattoo of the armor of God. So I said, who better to preach the passage than my friend Jay uh, today? So will you come up here and let me pray over you, and then you can preach the word. And we're thankful for, for you and excited to hear what God has to say through you today. <laughs> yeah, don't stomp too much. Father, thank you so much for my brother, Jay. For all he's been to me, he's been your hands and feet to me. Kim has been your hands and feet to our family, and, and we're so thankful for that. Thank you for what you're going to do in Youngsville, North Carolina. Your timing is perfect, and they're learning that right now, that, that you are, are going to plant that church when you see fit to plant that church. And so as they're patient but yet striving at the same time, I pray you give them the perfect balance in that endeavor. Send the right people to them to be a part of the plant and that you grow something there that is not for the glory of man, but is for the glory of God and the fame of Jesus. Pray that as he opens up the book today, that he'll hide behind it and put his finger on the text and point to Jesus. And that'll be good enough for us today because there's nothing better. That is all that we need. So give us Jesus today through Jay's mouth and, and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Appreciate it. Love you. Well, if you're friends of the Bocales, you're definitely friends of ours. And who the Bocales love, we love. And you have been prayed for by Kim and I for how long? How long has it been, Paul? A while. Let's put it that way. It's been a while. It's been been a minute, as they say, somewhere in in, um, our territory. So, like Paul said, I'm not going to apologize for anything up here. Because Paul spoke the truth, okay? And so, just want to open up God's Word, and and then, I don't even know whether I can reach that sea so far away. So, I'll go with my notes, and I've got the scripture in my notes, okay? You all right with that? Okay. Y'all sit so far apart, what's the deal? Anyway, here we go. Um, I'm Paul read to 13. I'm going to go from 14 on. Is that okay with y'all? Okay. And the, the title of the message today is, but God. And there are many passages that begin with, but God. And in your lives, everybody has something that's going on in our lives. It seems like everybody has something. Proving a couple of things, we're not perfect, and that we need to look to our to God for Jesus to be in our lives, and so that's and and Jesus gives us something that is mighty through Paul, through Apostle Paul, and that's the whole armor of God. So, um, I started to title this message, and I don't want you to get this messed up, but I started to title this message. A, a friend of mine long ago said, um, God, everything is God versus Satan. Well, in the cosmos, yes, but God is still head, right? God is still in control. He is always in, in control, and he's more, more, way more powerful than Satan, and you need to Understand and know that. And we, as you understand that and know that in your lives, then you need to go tell others about that. So, here we go. And so do I. All right, and we'll start with 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth 
and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly. I ought to speak real quick. Paul and I were talking yesterday about um, people understanding our language, and I'm just going to go real quick on this, but um, you speak like most West Virginia folks. I speak from a county called Pender County, and it's almost like we have a different language, you know? And so we might put three words together into one, and so be careful if I do that. I apologize. I'm going to ask you a few rhetorical questions, okay? So they are rhetorical. I'm going to give you about a second to think about them. <clears throat> right now, there's, a, there's, and I'll probably, I'm going to read my sermon, okay? And as old as I am, I don't remember all the things, okay? So I'm not going to apologize about that. So right now, there is a war in, in Ukraine still, right? And what are the people who are fighting in Ukraine and Russia, what are they wearing? Are they wearing tennis shoes? What about their underwear? What about the hats that the soldiers wear? Do they look like a, a soft cap like Paul had on a while ago? And uh, like a baseball cap? No. I mean, maybe some do, right? But... This is kind of silly, isn't it? Because you know, basically know what they're, they're uh, dressed as. A soldier going to war is going to wear clothes that is apropos for the, that war. So let me ask you a question. If you were a soldier fighting in Ukraine-Russia war, how would you be clothed? Even if the uniforms, even with those uniforms on, how confident are you with you winning that war and your country winning that war? What about an enemy like cancer, COVID, other sicknesses? What kind of uniform would you wear with, when you're trying to fight this ugly disease? What about your marriage and your wife, guys? What about your husband? What if your husband doesn't love you? Or doesn't act like he loves you. The but God, this beginning, there is hope. There is hope. And hopefully you know the hope already. But if you don't, here we go. So, how do I fight these battles alone? What if I told you there was a, a way to never fight these battles alone anymore? What if I told you that you can have freedom and ability to fight that type of battle? You can describe, and any battle you can describe, and already know that you have won the battle. Now, I was going to preach on Mother's Day, so my notes here have to do with mothers, but I'm going to talk about mothers real quick. There are some of you that might have had an abortion or had a baby who died in your womb or have children in, who will not visit you only because they're in the military and, and they just can't get to you or uh, maybe they're right here close to you at home but they just won't visit for some odd reason and that's that just it's crazy right so let's address some of these issues okay so think with me as we go. 
If there is anyone in the room who do not know Jesus, and maybe some of the children are are like that, um, and maybe some of you, and if you don't know Jesus, just kind of listen here, Mercy Village Church. Paul and I have been praying for you for a long, long time, and we're so excited about what's going on here. And so we're going to go through this. Much of this message comes from the, the um, English Standard Version of the Bible, and it's a study Bible. The ESV Bible breaks down this passage of Ephesians six ten through 20 in, in three sections. The first one is strength of the Lord. Did you, um, or is that going to be brought? Okay. Second one is stand firm in the Lord. All right, uh, first one, strength in the Lord, which is 6, 10 through 13. Stand firm in the Lord is 6, 14 through 17. And the third one is stay in constant prayer. And that's 6, 18 through 20. Okay. And the main idea of the text. I don't know where that came from. The main idea of the text is put on the whole armor of God, Christian. And stand firm in his strength and be in constant prayer. So I have a few minutes, I think an hour, is that right? Oh, sorry. If there are any people in the room who do, who do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is when and where we need to listen and decide what to do. You're here because God led you. All you believers in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this passage and many others is why we want others to have Christ as their personal Savior. Have others to have Christ as their personal Savior. Just like you. So, 610 says, <clears throat> Jesus says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Without Christ, this is impossible. If we are not Christians, we stand in our own power. There are things in life, such as COVID, that if, I don't know how much y'all, how much COVID y'all got up here, but we had it tough down our territory. There are things in life, such as COVID, that if some people have contracted that sickness, they weren't able to shake it, and they died. And you might have had some in your own family that, that were like that. And um, then there's some that, that there was a mixture of COVID and some other things. And they're just tough and hard to work with. And sometimes can't even be cured yet. We can't fight these things with our own power and in our own power. We need the strength of Jesus. Jesus has the authority overall. Okay. Jesus is over Satan. As a Christian, we can be strong in his might because he has called us to be his children. Jesus is calling us. And so in our weakness, Jesus is overpowering strong, even over Satan. As a matter of fact, you can address Satan, and this is what you can do personally, okay? You can address Satan yourself and and say, well, I am back to the words. As a matter of fact, you can address Satan and demand him to get away from you or whatever situation in the strong name of Jesus, and he must go away. That doesn't mean that he won't return, because he will. You might think you're crazy by having to keep casting him out, but you're not. And But you're not you're not um, crazy, so don't think that. But Satan wants you to think you're crazy. But Jesus is, is stronger always. We've got to remember that, that Jesus is stronger always. ESV says, because Christians cannot stand on their own against superhuman powers, they must rely upon the strength of the Lord's own might and what is the immeasurable and greatness of his, of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his might, which he supplies chiefly through prayer. You'll see that in 618. Okay, the next one is put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The Greek word 
for whole armor refers to the complete equipment of a fully armed soldier consisting of both shields and weapons like those described in verses 14 and 16 through 17. Paul's description here primarily uh, draws primarily on the Old Testament allusions and overlap well with, with the um, Roman weaponry during that time, especially with the terms of the, the large door that you've read about, and or like a door. Uh, it's a door-shaped shield and the short stabbing sword. You'll see that in a few minutes. William Hendrickson addresses this in, in strong words about what pa- Apostle Paul said. Put on the full armor of God. Leave nothing out. You will need every weapon. Do not try to advance against the devil and his host with equipage from your own arsenal. Rather say with David, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. That's from 1 Samuel 17, 39. Such weapons as trusting in human merits, in one's own erudition or mental acumen, in the theory that sin, sickness, and Satan do not exist, will not avail in the evil day. Therefore, put on the... um, Put on the full armor of God, forged by him and furnished by him. Put it on. Equip yourselves with it so that you can be able to stand, not just to stand idle, but in the battle. You stand in the battle. Stand firm to hold your ground against the devil, um, against the devil's crafty methods. Dr. Tony Marita, from his um, Ephesians commentary, says, We need to know our enemy. His Greek title is Diablos, means slanderer. He opposes. He accuses. Satan in Hebrew means adversary. Consider some some other titles for Satan. The devil. Satan is the demon and his his (laughs) minions. The serpent. The god of this age. The dragon. There are many others. His various names display the fact that he is wicked, powerful, cunning. We need God's armor because we are facing one who opposes God in that cosmos. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This this is a list of spiritual rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and it it gives a sobering glimpse into the devil's allies, the spiritual forces of evil who are exceedingly powerful in their exercise of cosmic powers over present darkness. Now, listen to this. ESV says, and yet scripture makes clear that the enemy host is no match for the Lord, who has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over him, over them in him, in him being God. So that's this next one is a but God. Ephesians 1, 19 through 21 says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. How about that, Christians? We have power, we have all power in Christ when he called us to be his children. Right then. You need to understand that you have that power in Christ. Can't do it alone. It's in Christ. He became power within us. Put on the whole armor of God. Here's another but God. If there are any in this room who do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can change that today. Isn't that cool? That can change today. God's the only one who can change that. You are here for a reason because God made it possible. 
You can have that same power within you. Even though you think you might be weak, God Almighty is a strength in your weakness if you say yes to God. He is anyway. He's the strength anyway, whether you say yes or not. But if you say yes, he'll change your life. That part of this message is why I titled the message, and I was talking about God versus Satan. Because the fight is is in the cosmos, over our heads. It's not man to man, woman to woman, and woman to man, man to woman. The fight is, the, is in the cosmos instead of each other. Most of our, if not all, of our battles are spiritual battles. God is always in control. We have to think that way and understand that he is in control. Not Satan, not you. You're not in control. He is. And he has placed you on this earth for a reason. Ephesians 6, 7, uh, 6 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Because the Christian's enemies are superhuman spiritual forces, he cannot rely upon, or yeah, he cannot, us, we cannot rely upon human resources, but must take up the whole armor of God. The divine armor and sword of the spirit, which belong to the Lord himself, And to his message in Isaiah and uh, at least a couple times in Isaiah are made available for believers, for you, for you, for us. Along with stand in Ephesians 6, 11 and stand firm in 13, Paul portrays Christians as soldiers in the battle line, holding fast against the enemy's charge. In 516, Paul identifies this whole age as evil days. You're living in evil days. Yet, the outbreak of the satanic onslaught against Christ's people ebbs and flows through, through this era until the final day when the Lord of hosts will return in power and great glory to rend the heavens and rescue his people forever. That's us. We're going to get rescued. He says it right there. Stand firm is the second one. Stand firm in the Lord, 6, 14 through 17. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. John MacArthur's book, um, he has a quick reference book here. And he says, why does Paul insist in verses, uh, well, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, that Christians must be prepared for battle? MacArthur, and listen closely to him. MacArthur answers the question by describing Christians in in 4, 1 through 6, 9 as can be sure, you can be sure to encounter spiritual warfare. I don't know anybody in here that has not encountered some sort of spiritual warfare. Christians, you will face spiritual warfare. As Paul concludes his his letter to the Ephesians, he warns them about upcoming battles and instructs them for victorious living. MacArthur goes on to say that the Lord provides his saints. You're the saints. You Christians are the saints. The Lord provides his saints with sufficient armor to combat and to uh, and defeat the adversary. Ephesians six ten through 13, Paul says, Paul sets forth the basic truths regarding the believer's necessary spiritual preparation as well as as truths about the enemy, the battle, the victory. Verses 14 through 17 specify the six necessary pieces of spiritual armor with, with which God equips his children to resist and overcome Satan's assaults. The spiritual 
parallels the military equipment worn by the, by the soldiers in Paul's day. These are the six. First is the belt of truth. The soldier wore a tunic, a loose-fitting um, loose clothing. Since ancient combat was, was large, largely hand-in-hand hand, or hand-to-hand, the, t- the tunic was a potential hand- hindrance, that, all that uh, cloth out there, and danger. The belt cinched the loose material. And the belt here pulls all together the spiritual loose ends in truth or better, truthfulness. I'm going to give you a little example, okay? So I'm Jay Humphrey. So when, and we're talking about the truthfulness. When we speak the truth and are known by our truthfulness, there's no reason for us to be questioned about the words that come out of our mouths. So, here you are. You're in this, in this big room and, and among a bunch of people, and, and, and then you have a conversation with this guy. And he says, um, he said, hey, buddy, you see that dude over there? His name is Jay Humphrey. Be careful around him. You can't trust him. Sometimes he might tell the truth about this or that, and his story sounds good, but there are times that he tells stories that have been known to be lies. He thinks they're funny. Just be, just be careful around him. But God. But do you see that guy he's talking to? That's Paul Bokel. He is a dude that you can believe all the time. Paul knows that the words that come out of our mouths to be truth need to be truth. There's that truthfulness. That's the way we want to be known, by our truthfulness. So people can trust Paul. You can trust Paul. He is the kind of man you want to pattern your life. He talks about Jesus a lot. As a matter of fact, he has been talking to me about Jesus. I don't understand all the all the things about Jesus, but not yet. But I know Paul is is a truthful man. Here, let me introduce you to Paul Bokel. Second one is breastplate of right. Hush, honey. Sorry. A tough, sleeveless piece of leather or heavy heavy material covered the soldier's full torso, protecting his heart and vital organs. Because... Righteousness or holiness is such a distinctive characteristic about God, of God himself. It is easy to understand why it is the Christian's chief protection against Satan and his schemes. Boots of gospel. I said shoes of gospel, but these are the boots of the gospel, and you'll see. You'll see why. Roman soldiers wore boots with nails in them, and not upside down, but downside down so that they could grip the ground in combat. The gospel of peace pertains to the goodness that through Christ believers are at peace with God. He is on their side. And you can turn to Romans 5, 6 through 10 if you want to, and that will give you more of that. So that, here's a but God. For while we were still weak, at the, at the time, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a a good person would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were, concealed, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall be saved by his life. Shield of faith is the next one. And that's, this, this Greek word is usually referred, or usually refers to the, the large uh, shield that protected the soldier's whole body. It was kind of like a door, like I was telling you a while ago. 
The believer's continual trust in God's word and promise is above all absolutely necessary to protect him for or him or her from the temptations through every sort of sin. And the helmet of salvation is this. The says this. The helmet protected the head, which was always the major target in battle. This passage in pertaining to those who whom are already saved and know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Since Satan seeks to destroy a believer's assurance of salvation with his weapons of doubt and discouragement, the believer must be as conscious or her confident status in Christ as he or she would be aware of the helmet on your head and the sword of the Spirit. A sword was the was the soldier's only offens- offensive weapon that he had or she had. In the same way, God's word is the only weapon that a believer's needs, a believer needs, infinitely more powerful than any of Satan's devices. This is what Hebrews four twelve says: For the word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints of marrow and discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Dr. Tony Merida says this, it is the sword of the spirit, meaning the spirit makes the sword powerful and effective. Paul identifies it with God, with God's word. A term Paul uses, and listen closely to this, Paul uses this term often in in the gospel, when he's talking about the gospel. And he says, however, this time he uses, instead of using the word logos, Paul uses rhema, which usually refers to the spoken word. If that is the case here, then he is referring to speaking the gospel, which is powerful and affected by the Spirit of God. Here's another but God. Again, one hears echoes from Isaiah in about... Messiah. We are given it access to the weaponry of the Messiah for battle when we are united with him. We are to speak the gospel in the realm of darkness so that those who held captive by evil, and we were held captive by the evil, by the evil one before we became Christians. And, and then he says, by the evil one may go free. So the third point, stay in prayer constantly. This is verses 18 through 20. With all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We as Christians are instructed to pray at all times. We are to pray in the spirit. Prayer is the most, uh, I'm sorry, prayer is the main weapon that we have in these spiritual battles. The ESV explains when, when to pray, how to pray, and for whom to pray. And but God. 6.18 says, The weapons of warfare are spiritual because they are rooted in prayer, which is the Christian's most powerful resource. Prayer is to permeate believers' lives as a, a universal practice is seen by the use of, of these four terms, which are at all times in the spirit. Prayer can be defined as sincere thanksgiving and requests made to God with all prayer in supplication, praying for yourself or someone someone else or both. And with all perseverance, keep alert, watchful with all perseverance, showing God that we are serious in our prayers. And fourth, for all saints, all the saints, pray for all the saints who are every, who are all of you, who are, and all the other Christians that are out there. Prayer in the Spirit is a form of worship, enabled by the Spirit of God. 
who, who intercedes on behalf of the person who prays. Romans, that's Romans 8, 26 through 27. And wrapping up and applying, the strength of the Lord is in 10 through 13. Put on the whole, the whole armor of God and stand, not in your own strength, but in the strong power of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who stands within us against the superhuman powers. Number two, the verses 14 through 17, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the face of dreaded enemies because the Lord Almighty has prepared you and equipped you by saying to your enemies, enemies, in the power of the strong name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, you must get away from my life and out of the lives of the people I'm praying for. I like what Alice, Alistair Begg says, and I'm paraphrasing like crazy here. He says, and this is, he's saying this in the face of our, his enemies, and this is what we can say. Enemy, I am prepared because Jesus Christ is my authority. Jesus has already armed me with his authority. Therefore, enemy, get away from me and everyone I am praying for in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Third one. Man, I can't wait that with that. Stay in, stay in constant prayer, 6, 18 through 20. D.A. Carson, in his commentary, says, Pray. Prayer, prayer is not another piece of armor, but is the way believers appropriate God's armor and stand firm. In the Spirit, inspired and guided by the Spirit, who himself pr- provides access to God. We don't have to go anywhere else. Go to him. Pray also for me. Paul says this. Pray also for me. Leaders, pastors should be willing to ask for prayer because the gospel is a mystery that has been revealed and is now proclaimed publicly. Please pray your, for your pastor and his family and continue to do that. As he prays for you, you need to pray for him too. John Piper says, God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so that we can call headquarters for every need as the kingdom of Christ advances the world. That's, his, that's in his book, um, Let the Nations Be Glad. Pastor Tony Merida says this, We pray comprehensively with alls, for alls. We pray at all times. We pray with all prayer and supplication. We should stake, we should stay awake and alert and pray with all perseverance. Is that, yep, one more. Think about this. If the, yeah, check this out. If Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, right, is asking for Christians to pray for him to be bold as he is an ambassador for King Jesus because he, Paul, does not have sufficient resources to communicate the gospel effectively. So he calls on the church to pray for him. Pray for each other. Therefore, church, Mercy Village Church, what should you be doing? Prayer. Pray. And the main idea of the text here has been put on the whole armor of God, Christian, and stand firm in his strength and be constant, be in constant prayer. And here's one little part, one last little part. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. And you were dead in your trespass. You were dead in the trespasses and sins among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy, being of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But God. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing me to get behind this pulpit. Lord, I pray that your word has been heard and seen and not me. Thank you, Father, for calling your people to you and changing our lives. If there be one or more in this room today whose life needs changing for, for you, Lord, please call them today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. We're going to move to a time of communion together. <clears throat> today we're going to uh, read the passage and then we'll get up and, and Paul and I will serve you at the tables and we'll sit down together and we'll all take to, uh, partake together. Uh, but at first I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so before we take today, we want to take a moment of uh, reflection, confess any sin that might be uh, between you and God. Uh, but believer, know this, that forgiveness is always there. Uh, we are forgiven of sin, past and present. And he, he promises that he's faithful uh, to forgive us of sin. So we confess the sin that may be in our life currently. And we do this, we're going to partake this meal, this together as family today. In the down and to know you is to love you and to know so little else I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how. truly is a celebration think about what this means I know we've a lot of us may have done this for for years this is Christ's body that was broken for us and this is a symbol of Christ's blood that is shed for us let's pray together Heavenly Father Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you that we can come before you no matter what we have done. And, and we 
always find forgiveness. Uh, it's because of Jesus that we have nothing of ourselves that we can bring to you, no matter how good we think we are and we think we're good. But God, you tell us that it's the same as, as filthy rags. It is of no good to you what we bring. It's only through Jesus. And as he is making us new and showing through Scripture who he is and what he has done for us, and he is teaching us, we are, we are becoming more like Jesus. That is the regeneration. And so thank you today that we can gather today and we can hear the kids singing and we can learn about who you are and what, you're, what you've done for us. We are unworthy of that. But you bring us in and you call us sons and daughters. You know us. It's not just that we know you. A lot of people know who you are. It says the demons even know who you are. But God, you know us intimately. You know who we are. And what we have done, and yet you love us anyway. So thank you for that today, God. Father, in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jay, for a reminder, as the book of Ephesians says over and over again, in the Lord, of the Lord, to the Lord, in the Lord, of the Lord, to the Lord, in the Lord, of the Lord, to the Lord. I mean, it's all through the book, and your hope of standing firm in this life, which feels like a battle sometimes, doesn't it? Comes in the Lord, of the Lord, to the Lord, through the Lord. He gives the armor. You ain't going to make it on your own. It comes from him. And so uh, that's the reminder. We'll close the book out next week. Excited for that. Pray for Youngsville, North Carolina. Uh, church planting is God's way of, of spreading the gospel to people who haven't heard yet. That's happening here because of this church plan, not because other churches in Barbersville, uh, aren't adequate to accomplish what God's called them to. They are, they're reaching people. We're reaching people too. There's works in Raleigh and, and points surrounding that are reaching people with Jesus. But what will happen in Youngsville, Lord willing, by the grace of God, will reach specific people who wouldn't be reached otherwise without the planting of that church there. And so pray to that end, uh, that, that God will do something special there in the coming, coming months and years. We're going to close with the Nicene Creed. We'll, we'll read this together. This is thousands of years of church history. This has been said since 340 A.D. You think Jay's old. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is old. But these words stand the test of time. We cling to them together as people of faith. This will be our dismissal as we read them together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in our one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all world, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the father. From thence, he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life who proceedeth from the father who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You're dismissed.